it's it's not very nice to have you i heard your uh um your uh talk with doug katesian on the podcast so they're they're good friends of ours okay yeah uh, a couple of months ago i think yeah Yeah. and i thought god dang i gotta get a hold of her (laughs) and uh because you you talk about an area that, that i'm i that i love talking about and uh and actually, I trained my, my kids are like 12 to what 14, I think. Yeah, something like that 12 to 15, something like that. Maybe a little bit younger once in a while, but but uh, um, well, that's that's great. It's very nice to meet you, Elizabeth. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going with that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna sit here and try to try to do that, and I'll just screw it up. So, um, uh, but anyway, this is Elizabeth. Uller, I can't get it like Doug does, but sorry. <laughs> um, and she's a coach in Germany, was a weightlifting coach. And um, uh, we're going to sit there and just ask some questions. And basically, this is just like a conversation you'd have at a dinner table with some other coaches. That's how we treat it. So if you got questions, ask. Okay. okay. I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't like interviews. Okay. And so it's just talking. And when you got to go, you tell us I got to go. And that's the end of it, right? Um, start out and give, give us a little bit of your background. You got a really interesting background, I know, um, from lawyer or almost lawyer to coach. And <laughs> yeah. My dad, my dad was a lawyer, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, where do I start? That's always the most difficult part. Um, uh, uh, what, where, where are you from in Germany? Um, so currently I live um, in the southwest, so at the border to Luxembourg, so it's not far to France and Luxembourg and Belgium and like this part of Germany, um, but originally I'm from Berlin, so uh, I'm, I'm from the city, um, but yeah, because of several jobs, I, I, I always traveled around in Germany, um, right. worked wherever I got a job offer, so I think that's sure. also part of part of coaching life, especially when when you're a young coach. Yep. So yeah, I've I've been to a few places here in Germany, but at the moment I'm in the southwest. Okay. Um. What What do you do there? I mean, what's what? Um, uh... Yeah. So I started my own business in the beginning of this year. Um. The last three years, I worked for German weightlifting. I had a full time position there. Uh, a full-time coaching uh, role um, with, yeah, with leading the talent identification part. Um, and uh, I quit that job end of last year for several reasons. Like the situation in international weightlifting is not that good at the moment. Um, you think? <laughs> I think so. It's not really, it's, it's something that, I think like, especially during the pandemic uh, when everything got published and we had like this big corruption scandal and doping cover ups, like over 150 cases. And um, then the McLaren investigation and the McLaren report. And like, it doesn't look good for weightlifting uh, to remain in the Olympic program. They've, oh, they've that was done- my next question. Yeah. <laughs> It doesn't look very good and I don't feel, and especially over the last year after the McLaren report came out, I didn't really feel like the, I didn't really feel like the member federations are actually, they, they don't actually want to change. I think there are more member federations or more nations that benefit from the system that is or that was, uh, I think it still is in charge. Um, then there are member federations that actually want a clean sport. So um, th- this where, is why. Where, 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 where does Germany stand on this? So G- Germany, I think, is one of those is one of those countries, especially especially in the last, I would say, since two thousand, that has like that had massive problems with the international doping situation because we had a lot of athletes not qualifying for the Olympics because of that. Like, I think, I think I know a few, like, I, I, I know at least five athletes that never qualified to the Olympics um, and they would have qualified if, uh, 
the testing would have been better because all their opponents and everyone they always lost against they got they got busted afterwards sure. so it's kind of a very sad situation because it's a very sad situation for them um because they never got that chance and and now they they look back and they said okay but i deserve that chance because all the others were actually um i was i was clean they weren't but they took that chance away from me so um the do the anti-doping system in germany is pretty strict um especially in high risk sports like weightlifting so uh, the german weightlifting federation starts testing um at the age of 14, 15, every athlete is, uh, that is in an Olympic training center is tested regularly. Um, we do whereabouts, so all of them are in ADAMS. Like if, if you know a bit about um, international anti-doping system, ADAMS is like where they have to put in uh, the place where they are, uh, what they're doing, um, et cetera. So they can always get doping controls. And I had doping controls with kids. So we're 14 or 15 year olds. So it's like very strict here. It's not that strict in other countries. And that's, uh, that's the biggest, that's the biggest issue. And um, especially like following everything that happened after that corruption and, and doping scandal came up um, in the beginning of 2020, I didn't feel like there is a, like, I didn't feel for myself that this is like an environment I want to work in um, because actually it's like that constant feeling of there will never be a fair competition. And I don't want to convince athletes and, and, and especially not convince young athletes to sacrifice so much for being in a sport and being in an environment that's completely corrupt and unfair. Like, becoming a weightlifter um, is a very, that's a very, very hard and long way. And it's a very, you have to sacrifice so much and you have to train so hard and you have to go through so much to achieve that. And um, I don't I, like, you have to, you, it takes a lot. It takes a lot for a young athlete. And I don't think like with knowing that there is no fair competition on elite level, and there is not really an intention to have a fair competition or any will to change anything. I don't think it's fair to put athletes through that, especially um, here, like where, where they are getting tested regularly and having this constant feeling of like, I never really have a chance because the others are cheating and knowing that I don't think that's something um, that should, that you want to deal with in sports. So uh, I decided that this is not really an environment I want to work in. So, um, and that I'm going to switch or try to transition to strength and conditioning and work with other sports where that problem isn't that big. Like that doping is a problem in almost every sport. That's not a secret, but I don't, I think the situation in weightlifting is, is, is extreme. Oh. So you think it's worse in weightlifting than say track and field or something like that? I don't know. I don't know enough about track and field, but in weightlifting, it's definitely in, in weightlifting. It's, it, it's worse because there are actually countries involved and there are nations right. involved and there are like, it's, it's, it's not just the organization. Like um, if you've, if you read the, the McLaren report, uh, after the, the corruption accusations, there are actually countries involved, like governments. Yeah, so yeah. it's a much bigger thing than, than, than it's, it's not just in the sports world. It's, it's, like, it's, it's a bit like the Russian doping scandal where you have like public financed uh, mm -hmm. doping systems and where you have actually governments bribing sports organizations to have athletes at the Olympics because that's what happened. Um, that's what happened in weightlifting. Like the money that some member federations got, they got it from their government to bribe mm -hmm. the IVF to have like athletes at the Olympics that actually should have been banned. So I don't think it's, it's that big in other, or it's, it's, it's that deep and that rotten in other sports and in, in weightlifting, it's in weightlifting. It's a whole nother level. Like I read the, the McLaren report 
and it it sounds like a it sounds like a a Netflix documentary, like those crime <laughs> documentaries. Like literally, there were I think it was from Moldova. Like Mo Moldova wanted to get through or three athletes uh, through uh, and cover the doping cases up, and they were traveling from Moldova with with um, bags full of cash to Hungary and gave it to the IVF headquarters. Like that could be from a movie, but it actually happened. So it's like, or the, all the double ganger stories, like they were actually, I think it was Romania or Moldova. I'm not even sure which country, but they, they, they did castings for double gangers so that, that they could go to the doping controls. Really? <laughs> like, there, yeah, that they could be from from like documentaries and movies on Netflix, <laughs> but that actually happened. So it's like, yeah, it's like for me, it's uh, it's wow. actually ridiculous. Like I'm now, it's funny, but when 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 I was working in weightlifting, I was like, no, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> feeling the gangsters here, <laughs> like you're. <laughs> So just to let you know, I've been involved in weightlifting for the last 25 or 30 years, right? Yeah. Uh, up until four or five years ago. But anyway, and I've heard the same stories all through all through that 25 or 30 years that, yeah. that I was involved in it. And, you know, it's just it's it's it, you're right. It is like a documentary. You, you can have a whole you can have a whole slew of them. Just take a country and start with it. Like, you know, like a crime movie out of it, actually. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and uh, um, you know I've heard stories about Ion and the the ex president of USA or of uh, the IWF and uh, and stuff like that. It's it it just made me laugh. I was, you know it's just it's just funny. You know it's it's so it's so it's so preposterous. I know that that uh, we held the junior junior worlds one year here in the United States. And I thought it was so bad. He said, you'll never get another uh, world championship, right? And they actually had to, I don't want to say bribe, but they, they actually had to do, you know, take him to Laker games. And every time they, you know, they, they go to Hungary to talk to him, they'd send his wife all these flowers. And one time they had to buy him a shotgun that he wanted, you know, just to, just to get in to talk to him. And it's, it's hilarious. You know, you're, you're, you're exactly right. <laughs> And, and yeah. you know, and, and the sad part about it is that they, you know, it's such a great sport for kids. You know, even if they don't go to the international level, I never cared about that. But just as a confidence builder and to give them confidence, you know, I've seen, you know, tons of kids like that, that, you know, got involved in the sport and things and not that they were any good at it, but it just, it just gave him a whole sense of confidence. I had a, I had a kid one time training me for six months and never spoke to me. Wouldn't, wouldn't say hi or anything. You know. And I took him to weightlifting meet one time and so I meet he ever competed in. And the next day I can't shut the kid up. You know, just all of a sudden he had all, all his confidence just because I made him go on his, on a platform by himself, you know, and uh, they never, he played baseball. So he never, he could always hide, you know, and things so I mean it's just really too bad that weightlifting's like that and I've, I've followed it you know still but um uh, uh but that that's that's interesting that you say you say all that I'm, I'm sitting here laughing to myself because I've heard all these stories and, and it's just like Corey that Corey doesn't know him but uh, I may have told him some of them but but uh um th th those are those are great um well let me ask you since we're on the on the topic of weightlifting uh, and I know that you use weightlifting movements in your sport training. Okay. Um, what, uh, first of all, what age groups do you work with? You work with all age groups, I'm assuming, but I'm more interested in the kids. What, what, um, how do how do you start, um, you know, and, and different things like that with, with teaching them the movements and, and then we'll go on to the more long-term type things, but. Um, so uh, one thing I did want to ask you while I'm thinking about it, because I'll forget, you say in Germany, they test everybody from 14 up, right? When was there a age limit when they could compete? Um, yeah. How, how did that work? 
Yeah. So, yeah. So, oh, let me start first. So, I've I've actually worked with all kind of age groups and in all kind of different athletes from completely wow. different backgrounds. So, uh, quite a wide variety. Um, I work. I think it it comes across on social media that I work more with kids, but. Uh, yeah, I post more about kids because I think my coaching adults is, is a bit more it's boring, actually, <laughs> to, to, to post. It's way more fun with uh, with the kids. Sure. So, oh, yeah. That's why, why this impression uh, uh, comes that I actually just coach kids, but I don't. Like, I, I have a lot of master's athletes at the moment um, yeah. and uh, a lot of others. Um but so competition, competitions in Germany are a bit different uh, or weightlifting competitions in, in, in the German uh, weightlifting system here or in the Federation are a bit different than it is, for example, uh, in other countries. Um, we actually want to avoid um, early specialization, even though we are kind of doing that. Um, so we, 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 even though a lot of the kids specialize on, on, on weightlifting or do weightlifting all year and don't have this whole multi-sport approach that you probably have in the US, um, the sport system here in Germany is much, is very different than in the US. We don't have college sports. We don't have high school sports. So everything is on a, on a private basis and on a, on a volunteer private basis, basically. And um, so uh, the majority of kids that do weightlifting here do it not because of doing another for another sport, they do it because of weightlifting. Um, and uh, we have come or we start competitions usually at like on on national level so German championships at the age of 13 um, but it's not that they gonna do like a total they have a total but it doesn't really count much so the the weightlifting competition from third at the age of 13 14 15 consists of um they do three attempts of snatch obviously three attempts of a clean and jerk and then they, they have judges that get give them technique points and then we have like a that that's like a counting system then for the 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 total and the technique points that they get from the judges um which are more worth than the than the total they are then the result for the weightlifting part so for example it's like lifting more actually doesn't really give you more points but having better technique will always give you much more points so right. that's how it works at that age group and then they have like a second part um that's it's called like athletics um where they have to do three or sometimes four or five it always depends on who's organizing the competition where they have to uh, at least uh, do three different um, athletic um, tests. Usually it's a jump, a sprint, and some kind of throw. Uh, usually they do like a med ball back, backward throw, so we can see like the triple extension. Uh, they do like a shuttle sprint kind of race against each other. Um, and they do um, a, a, either a standing broad jump or a triple response broad jump. Um, and then some 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 organizers they add like max pull ups or max push ups or any like other exercise or tests that they want to do, um, and then this is I like the second part of of the competition, and they have to do this. Uh, at the age of 13, 14, 15, and then at the age of 16 they move to only having a total, so this is why we try to avoid them. Or we want to, or, or the, the the German youth uh, weightlifting system, they want to avoid them already doing like normal, like th they want to avoid basically burning them out early. <laughs> that, no, that, I, that's basically yeah. what we want to do. Yeah. So I know, I know. So in the 13, 14, and 15s, then is is the weight they can lift limited, or can they lift as much as they want? No, they can lift as much as they want, but usually it's like it's it's better for them to use less because then they take they then then they have like higher technique points. Right, and, right. 
And we have that rule that if they miss, they're not allowed to take more. So they always, when they have a missed rep uh, or missed attempt, they have to stay at the same weight. Right. So um, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, um, uh, um, I can't think of his name. Zygmunt um, is from Poland. I think he coaches in Norway now, but he was a national coach here for a while. Mm-hmm. And I talked to him and he said in Poland, I think it's, it's 14 and under, or maybe 15 and under. They were limited. So I guess it's a law in Poland. You can't lift more than 50% of your body weight in snatch and more than hundred percent in clean and jerk. Yeah. And he said that they had technique meets and they had to lift within those parameters. So, so really limited to, to, to what they were doing. And, and I know there's other countries I've talked to. I, I'm talking to a guy now from Bulgaria. And he said that, that they were, there was no competition at all from 12 to 14. Yeah. And he said they, they learned a bunch of skills in different sports, weightlifting being one of them. And, um, uh, and I, I didn't know, I didn't know. I knew I have a good friend of mine that, that met the, uh, the national German coach. I can't think of his name several years ago. It was an older guy. And, you know, he showed him the, the technique points, you know, that they, that they talked about and different things. And, and, uh, uh, and I, I, when I was on the, uh, youth committee for USA weightlifting, I tried to, I tried to get that implemented and I almost got hung. <laughs> so, so we, I mean, we, you know, we, we, I just read about an eight year old girl who won the youth nationals last year. And yeah, that, that's a very, um, yeah. And I think I, I, I wrote something, I tweeted something about that the other no day. Video? Um, yeah, because like. I get like I don't want to I'm, I'm, I'm usually not someone who talks negative about any other coaches or I'm usually not someone who's very like I don't I don't care what other people do but what she does is difficult it, it makes my life very difficult because oh, yeah. it makes my life as a coach um, especially with um, who wants to convince parents and wants to convince others that strength training with kids and weightlifting for kids is actually beneficial videos like or what she does is very it's it doesn't help me much because (laughs) that's exactly what parents are afraid of that's what what happens with her is exactly what parents are afraid of and what they want to avoid so Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's, it's difficult for me to deal with that because um, I feel like in way, or I feel like with that whole strength training with kids topic, they are always extremes. Like it's those people that want, that tell you like kids don't need a barbell. They shouldn't, they should only do body weight and they should do only do physical education and only sprinting and jumping and throwing. And then there's this other side that are training like adults <laughs> that do that approach weightlifting like training that, that's just like she's she's basically training like an adult and yeah. it's very difficult difficult for that middle part because like that that's actually what I want to do it's like it's like it's okay to add barbells into a kids program and teaching yeah. them how to snatch and teaching them the technique and 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 whatever but they also have to do all the, the physical education stuff with, with with fundamental movement skills, et cetera. And we are not doing a, a progressive load or we're not progressing load over time with, with a kid. Actually, ma- the majority of kids like that, ha- they have no clue how much they actually lift. They actually also don't really care about numbers if you don't teach it to them. Like mm-hmm. they don't give it, they actually don't really give a damn about numbers. If you, you as a coach or as a parent don't teach them what that actually means. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think, and that's something that I have done differently with the kids I've coached. We always had like, uh, out from the beginning, I kept parents away. <laughs> like I, I was in a position when, when I had kids groups that uh, I could say, okay, I don't want to have parents here. Um, I, I think not everyone can do that, but I did. 
And then we did, um, then we did like a level system and we just painted the, or, or we just had different colors of, of plates. They all were the same basically, but when they, when they, for example, um, when, when I gave them uh, 10 points for their technique, then they were allowed to add like either a little bit of weight or change to another plate. So what I basically have done was like, we have like these two and a half kilogram plates and we mm -hmm. have had them in white and in, in green and in, in yellow and in, um, and in red. And then we progressed over the colors. So red was the end color, like there was level really? five. And then uh, uh, blue and yellow, uh, they, these were the different levels before. It didn't, the, the, the kids didn't care about the weight, they just cared right. about the colors. Because right. red was the best, and like right. the, the white ones were the beginner ones, and then the next level was green. And it was not the next level was like 10 kilograms or 20 kilograms or 25, the next level was green. Uh, and then yellow and then blue and then at the end it was red it was so, always the same weight and but i could teach them like a technical progression over time so so all the weights were the same you're just going for different colors right yeah yeah oh that's that's awesome that's a really good idea there you go Corey. There's, a, there's a there's a there's a thing for you yeah um, i like that um so, going off that i'm kind of curious what are some other ways you implement I guess, certain constraints in your training to help kids develop a positive relationship with weightlifting, training, sports, and all, yeah. all those other activities? Yeah, I think what always worked with me, but, um, or what I've always done is like, I always made deals with kids. Like we always had like some kind of goal setting that they suggested. And I like, I, I kind of negotiated with them. So for example, but what we also did is like, or what I also did is um, when they wanted to add, for example, smaller plates or add weight or progress to some other exercise, for example, um, to push press, then we made a deal that they have to show me that they can hold a handstand for at least 10 seconds against the wall. And if they could achieve that, then we could progress with uh, push press or overhead press or whatever they wanted to do so, so everything I always set like goals or we always negotiated goals um, and then we made a deal and when they achieved that then they could then they could progress to something so like working with those levels or colors or whatever um, that that works very well like I always try to stay away from numbers at that age because they also don't really understand that. Like I've seen that once in uh, with other kids, not from my group, but from another um, from another club. Um, they did a. They were all like 10, 11, and they did a weightlifting competition, and they had no clue why someone else won or why they didn't win or why um, why they won or whatever. Because they have like this whole weight class and like that that you lift weight relative to your weight they don't understand that at all. They have no clue what that means. So it was like these, these kids, there was one kid that won and then he went to his coach afterwards and said, I don't even know why I won because this kid did more than me. And then he tried to explain, yeah, but this kid is heavier than you. Um, and then the kid was like, I don't, but he did more. And like, it's very difficult at that age to explain how weightlifting works with all the weight classes and, and all the, the different, uh, with, with Sinclair points and, and whatever you have. Like, I'm not really a fan of that at that age. They don't get that. So um, yeah, what worked for me is always like make goals with the kids, um, let them come up with stuff. Like, for example, sometimes they even made suggestions themselves, um, what they should, what they, and, and especially what they can also practice at home. Like, for example, this whole handstand thing, there was something every kid did at home. Um, and, and, and then you get them moving in their free time as well. So these are some easy things to, um, yeah, to how to get them engaged and how to also keep them motivated over time. How, how did, how did, uh, um, 
how did you come up with these ideas? Did, did you go, did you go to school and they, and they kind of <laughs> mentioned it or, or, I mean, I know, I know, you, I know you, I know you went to law school for a while. Yeah. And then, then you switched <laughs> It was to not very successful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> law school is hard. <laughs> yeah. No, um, no, actually, uh, yeah, I've been to law school. That was not very successful. Um, and, but I studied sports science um, in, uh, from 2018 till beginning of this year. I don't really talk much about it because uh, that was basically a, um, that was basically like, a, I have to make up for the time that I lost during my law degree. Um, and yeah. I already coached before I started studying. Um, and I studied from 2018 until beginning of this year. I, grad I have a bachelor in sports science. Um, and I'm currently enrolled in a master's program also with a, with a focus on pedagogy. Like my bachelor was also with a specialization in, in pedagogy and um, now my master's is the same. So, so um, I'm, I'm always interested in the, in the educational system because in, in this area in the United States, it's not very good. And uh, like my friend from Bulgaria, you know, they went to, they had the, the master of school, master university of coaching and, and things like that where he went. And so what, what was the, subjects the education like that you took in your uh, sports science right yeah uh, sports science uh, bachelor so um yeah i had this pedagogical uh focus and um education in sports so what like basically the majority or i did a lot of modules with the focus on how to teach um, we also, I did a lot, some modules together with physical education teachers, um, the same in my, in my master's now. Um, I did, the, I did the, the, the normal modules in, in, um, in um, like exercise science and biomechanics and uh, physiology. I did all of that, but like the specialization was more in like modal learning, how to teach like pedagogy, like um, didactics. How do I talk to children? Um, like the development stages they are in, um, especially um, from a psychological or from a co cognitive perspective, these are like the modules that I chose um, during my during my bachelor's and also now during my master's. Um, okay. So it's very it's very it, everything was very focused on development. Like for weightlifting itself, um, I went through all the like it took me I think three years to go through the whole education of the German Weightlifting Federation. Wow. So I'm like an I have an A license. Um, I don't know how to compare that to the US actually, but well, it, here you, you take know, a two day course and all yeah, of a sudden you're no. really <laughs> here, like the actually the entry, so that's a C license. The, the, the first license you can get here from German weightlifting is a C license. I did that in 20, I think 2017 or something. 2016 I'm not even sure um there you have to do I think almost 200 hours of taught content uh, or of 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 lessons and uh, you have to do like a demonstration you have to do a test like an exam you have to do uh you have to write like an assignment um mm. and uh, you have to do a lot of different things and then uh then you have then you have to wait a year and in that year you have to coach you also have to prove that that you're actually coaching um for a few hours a week um even if it's just two on a volunteer basis that's fine but like you have to prove that you are actively coaching and then you can progress to the b license then that's the next level uh the the b license is um focused on basically uh youth the all the youth development stages um so from from youth to junior and then you have the then you have another year where you have to coach i think it's a it's the b license also is like over 100 hours of of uh of uh, taught uh lessons 
and then you have the have to coach another year and then you get the a license that's then focused on um developing elite athletes wow and that's another i think 150 hours or something so i've really done a lot of hours no, <laughs> of, I, 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 uh, that for getting that uh, but this is how the this is how the this is how it works here. Um, I think it's it it might be a barrier for a lot of coaches to have like um, this to to invest that amount of time um, into your education. But at the same time, it's like I think we have every two years there are around ten till twelve A license um, uh, coaches that that graduate basically so it's not a lot of people that are not a lot of coaches that are actually on that is it and what's the I'm, I'm just asking this what's the delivery system is it through a book is it through online classroom it's in person or do you have to go somewhere it's, it's no, in you person to, yeah you have to go to the uh to the uh high performance uh, the weightlifting high performance center and all courses and like all modules are taught by the national coaches. Okay. So, how, so, so how long yeah. does that take? I mean, you say, say 200 yeah, hours. We're usually there for a week. So oh. it's not a weekend course, but it's like a week. And yeah. then in between, like you have to, you have to do the assignments and you have to do like the, the exam and all of that stuff. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I just, I didn't mean to get off on that. It just interests me. That's all. Um, you mentioned in one of, one of your interviews um, that strength, strength conditioning coaches don't understand PE curriculum, right? Yeah. And I, and so, so, so I'd love for you to expound on that. Yeah, but I've also learned now that PE here is very different to PE in the U.S. For I'm example, I'm not so sure, but go ahead. Or, and and, and you, like youth strength and conditioning, for example, that doesn't exist here in Germany. Like this is nothing right. you do in schools. So everything you do in schools is PE anyway. So the the thing about physical education, uh, the physical education uh, here in Germany is like here in Germany, it's actually trying out sports. Like when, when I look back at my, at, at what I did in PE, it's basically just trying out sports. And then you, 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 we played volleyball, we played basketball, we played, um, we, everyone had to learn swimming here uh, in, in, in every public school as well. So it's something that's part of it too. Um, I even had to do like, um, like acrobatics and, and, and juggling and all of that stuff. So uh, you just try out every sport, uh, that exists and then you play, I don't know, games, maybe, uh, like dodgeball. That's like physical education here. It's not, it's, it's different to, to definitely different to the U S I think, because, uh, that's not like PE in the US is I think a bit uh, different than what we do here. So I think there's this, there's this, um, there's this, it's a bit difficult to explain um, because I, I think I'm doing like a bit of like a mix of both. So my, my, what I, I do for athletic development is like a bit of youth S and C, whatever that means and uh, physical education. I mix all of that up. Like I do all those fundamental movement skill uh, stuff with kids, but at the same time also do Baba Baba work or, or let them uh, do uh, stuff with uh, dumbbells or kettlebells so um, like I mix all of that up but what I uh, feel like in the in, in other countries is they don't really take PE serious it's for them it's just like a bit of playing around and and doesn't really contribute that much uh, and should be focused it should be focused on youth uh, SNC more I don't really see that 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 hybrid, it's so separated in the, especially in the U S um, we don't have that here. I don't know. <laughs> so, so like when I, I'm a lot older than you two guys, but when I took PE, we did the same thing. I mean, we, we learned everything. We did gymnastics. We did yeah. all kinds of games. You know, we even 
danced and folk danced, which I hated, and and uh, uh, and all, all those different things. So the classes weren't weren't co-ed; they were separate, and except for the dancing. And and uh, um, and I think now Corey Corey can probably talk better about it since he's a lot younger than I am. Um, that uh, um, that now it's I, well, what I mean, what's it like now, Corey? I don't know. Uh, it's pretty similar to Germany in some ways. Like we have different units of sports, and they like try to teach you the skills and integrate into the games. But other times it was kind of like, oh, we're just gonna do free play today. So like we play like pick up basketball. Or like some people just be like sit in a circle and talk and like it was kind of disorganized but they they tried to make some units with certain sports They're like we had a badminton unit volleyball like european handball we had to we had to swim to a middle school which a lot of people didn't like you had to change and go in the locker room and all that between classes but they tried to make it have different units but yeah. um i don't know if this is true in germany but in high school we have the option for you can opt out of regular pe and just do weightlifting instead strength strength and conditioning yeah you could take like a strength and conditioning class and that would give you your pe credits where you didn't do any like typical pe you would just go to the weight room and like basically work out for an hour instead yeah no that doesn't exist here like at all like the no i don't i don't know there's not not any there's not i don't know of any school here that has like uh, that has a weight room so uh this is it's a it's a bit that's a bit different uh, but, but because, because we also don't have s sports in schools, so it's all organized on a private basis. Now, like, I think what I said in, uh, in the other interview is like that, I think PE has like a bit of a, or, or the classic PE has like a bit of like a, like a lot of strength coaches don't really understand what that actually means, especially making like these movement experiences and, 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 and not having like those structured sessions where everything is taught. It's also like it, at, at the same time, it's not just free play, um, but it also allows kids to, have, to, to make experiences themselves and figure out stuff themselves. Um, strength coaches usually don't really do that. They would never, uh, uh, they would never let a kid just try out something. Uh, and try to figure out how maybe they can get that that barbell overhead. Um, that I would probably also not really really recommend that when I have like a big group. But um, I've done that with kids though. Like uh, I've tried to, for example, teach like how, what it what it means to generate power from from the legs to uh, or to transfer power from the legs to the upper body through like a push press or a med ball throw or whatever, and then ask them what they think they should do so it, it it's easier. Um, like I think that all of that questioning and letting them try out stuff and making those those experiences. That's something that doesn't happen in youth S and C, but it happens in physical education. Um, it's something I think I covered in my online course where I said, okay, you, you have to let kids try out what's the difference between a strict press overhead and a push press. And why does the one feel lighter than the other one? And, and you have to, add, especially when you want kids to, to be aware uh, of stuff like that and you have to ask them and have asked questions and not show them like okay this is a strict press and this is a push press so do that now um this is this is like youth s and c probably and the other thing trying out and maybe asking them like what their experiences are with it and why do they think if they they push harder with their legs then it feels lighter uh, in their arms like does that even make sense? Like, like just ask them and have like this conversation. I think in youth s and you don't have time for that. And you, that's not also not the intention. You, in youth s and you're chasing adaptations and progressions. And uh, yeah, that's, that, that's how I think that's a bit of the confusion very often. So, and I think, say, what, go ahead, Corey. Well, I just like that because what you're describing is you're giving kids a chance to develop their own like internal, like basically body language of like, here's what kind of efficient movement feels like. Or when I do this, I get this result. Or when I try it this way, it doesn't feel as good. And I really like that. And like one thing Rufus and I like to teach is like a shuffle, just like a basic shuffle drill. 
And you'd be surprised how many kids don't realize what it's like to just like get a good push off and like feel like they're moving well. And just teaching that early on and giving them that like sense in that language, I feel like helps them later on when they do try to specialize, they have an idea of kind of what their body's doing in space and how they should be moving. Yeah, I think especially this transferring power from the lower to the upper body, that's something so many kids have no clue how that works and they have no clue um, in, in anything how that how they should how they should do that, how, how they can like make their life much easier actually. Um, and, and that's some, some of the foundations that actually should be taught in PE. Um, through you can do that with med balls you can do that with so much other stuff uh, or other tools and equipment you have um, I've used barbell, barbells uh, for that um, and also other tools so um, but in youth s and c they would just show the different exercises and then kids would do it and they wouldn't learn how to they wouldn't really understand what they're doing I think that whole understanding what they are doing and how they are moving their body that's very uh important in 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 physical education in youth s and c it's more chasing adaptations so in terms of your training what are you looking for in terms of what kids take away in terms of like certain skills or movements you want them to be able to do or to walk away with and feel comfortable doing and have a good sense of yeah so i think the most important Well, what I always say is like, I want them to become more competent in moving, like in general, they should, they should have like way more body awareness if they uh, get out of like my program um, and, and move on to someone else. I want them to like, I think that's something that that's very subjective. It's very hard to measure. It's very hard. It's, it's actually impossible to quantify in my, like how I do it. Um, but it's something I want them to get out and have and 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 and, and move on or, or play their sport and having way more body awareness in general and just moving more efficiently. So, and I think a good foundation of strength in general is also the foundation of um, fundamental movement skills. Like, I don't understand those people that are always, a, like, especially when I post post something about a kid lifting and then they say, yeah, they should just do fundamental movement skills. You need a foundation of strength to be able to do a lot of fundamental movement skills. And that's very often forgotten. And um, I know there are people that always make that, that, that are they, they don't think that strength training for kids is necessary and all the focus should be on those fundamental movement skills but a lot of kids that we are having right now are dealing with they have issues even performing fundamental movement skills because they have such a lack of strength like I literally sometimes like when you're working in schools, you see that more often than if you work in, in, a, in, a, in a sports club or something where you have like kids that are actually probably moving more. But especially in schools where in, in PE, when you have like kids that don't move much, um, they lack the basic strength of doing like a forward roll or something. And it's, you can let them try that multiple times and they won't get it right. And then don't come with fundamental movement skills when uh, you have kids that are not able to do them. And then you have to build that foundation of strength and weight training, in my opinion, is the best uh, or it is the easiest way because you can have so little loading and progress over time and then build build up to, to to for kids to even be able to perform fun fundament, fundamental movement skills i think the majority of kids now that i had in pe where they are not able to do a, a single push-up or pulling themselves up somewhere i even have kids that struggle to stand on one leg for more than like a second um, or they are not even they they have like such issues um and and a lot of those issues come from a lack of of, of strength or stability in their body that you can't even do those fundamental movement skills and um yeah that's why, why I've, I've i've very often chosen uh strength training and it's in my opinion it's a, one of the most underrated uh things you can do to get physically inactive kids 
physically active again. The barrier is so low, like strength training or resistance training. It's something where you where you can, as, as someone who has never moved or is completely physically active, that's something you can start without feeling like a complete loser. <laughs> Like, I think that's like, that sounds harsh now, but like, um, it, it's something where like the overweight kid that had never moved before and just spent time uh, watching, playing video games, that kid will have some sort of success when it starts resistance training. And that kid will never get accepted uh, if you, or this, this kid will not be happy if you say, oh God, we're going to, going to do relay races now with others. So um, in resistance training is, is, I think, has such a low, low, low entry uh, barrier and is so accessible for, um, or the accessibility is so, so good for, for physically inactive kids. So it's very underrated in my opinion. What, um, what, what, what does your fundamental movement skills look like? Yeah, I think it's the basics like running, sprinting, galloping, uh, shuffling, um, it's rolling, um, it's balancing, um, like I think like those those basics, um, but like maybe ju adding jumping, stuff like that, but I literally have issue. like I had kids that were not able to s jump and, 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 and leave the floor with both legs because their coordination just wasn't right. So it's, uh, it's it, that, that's something we are, I think we are dealing with now. So, um, yeah. So would you include, um, I don't know, I just call them movement skills, like, like just a body weight squat, doing that pro properly, uh, hip hinging, things like that. Would you, would you include that in there? Or is that something different? I think that's uh, that's like that's I think that's the foundations of uh, our strength training. I wouldn't uh, necessarily put that into those fundamental movement skills. Like fundamental movement skills, I think is um, is mainly like I would say it's like mainly those how you move, like moving from a from from A to B is like yeah, yeah I, I would I put that into that into that, that um, into that where I would classify it in, in that section. Yeah. So do you, do you find that you have to go back and teach kids all these things that they should have learned in a PE class? Because that's no, what I, I, I think. I think I have to teach kids now stuff that they should actually naturally be able to do. And that's the biggest issue I think I have uh, with uh, working with kids that are not they didn't grow up in a in a sports environment um like like i think probably like when i look back at what i did uh, in gymnastics and in in pe um in in school um there was every kid was able to do like a forward roll or a backward roll or every kid was able to was able to do like um the basic gymnastics movements the kids now they're not able to do that i have like sometimes i have kids that don't even run <laughs> like oh. they don't ever run <laughs> so that that's what you have in schools and pe like and that's what you have to that's that's how you have to to plan your sessions around with or around like i think um where a lot of discussions and strength and conditioning, especially in youth development, are fo like are focused on a very, very, very small group of, of, of kids nowadays. The majority of kids that we have are overweight, they are physically extremely inactive. Um, they also don't really have that desire to move much anymore. Um, and we always just have, we, we like, as, especially strength coaches are talking about like early specialization versus this multi-sports approach uh, and when to introduce which exercise they're like, they're discussing all of those topics, but the actual problems are this big bunch of kids that we have in schools that have, like, are physically completely inactive. <laughs> And it's getting more and more. Uh, one thing I find amazing is mo most of the kids I get can't can't jump rope. 
No. Yeah, yeah I didn't even try that. <laughs> no, I, I, I can't. I mean, I can't imagine because ever since I was a little kid, you jumped rope, right? Yeah. And, uh, um, and you know, even now the girls aren't too bad, but I don't have that many girls, but the, the boys are horrendous at it. And uh, um, I'm, I'm just shocked because, like I say, I can't, I can't ever remember not knowing how to jump rope. Yeah. But it, is, yeah. it also doesn't really help. But like I always, uh, it, it's something that really annoys me at the moment is like this, the, especially adults uh, and coaches in general complaining how soft this generation is and like how the kids are not able to do anything anymore and they, they don't have the skills and they don't have this and they don't have that and they don't have like the motivation and they they it's it's a lot of complaining about this the, the the kids nowadays but at the same time it's also the people that are complaining that's the generation that's actually raising those kids so, yeah. so <laughs> you make a great point i've heard you say that yeah that's a great point it's it's it that's the generation that's raising those kids and it's right. very yeah uh, it's we should i think it's it's the the whole complaining about how soft all the kids are nowadays and like that they don't have the necessary skills and whatever i think it doesn't really help much to complain um because like a lot of people must be or especially coaches must be honest to themselves they're not really doing anything to change that um sure. i think what what especially uh I think I've never gotten paid for, I've never really gotten paid for coaching kids. Like I make my money in, uh, with other stuff uh, or with other jobs that I do. Um, and uh, I'd always try to especially coach kids that don't have access to, to um, yeah, that don't have access to, to uh, any form of physical activity or sports and um a lot of other coaches don't do that, um, but they also complaining a lot about how this generation yeah. is is yeah. is physically inactive. Um, so it's it's kind of a yeah, it's something that really bothers me because we are we are making these kids how they are. They they always are. It, it's the environment that makes them like this. It's not right. them them that that yeah. So. And I feel like a lot of, especially youth sports is a lot of coaches that are in youth sports, they either want to do that elite high performance development, whatever youth sports uh, section. And that's the only thing they want. But like actually that big part of youth sports, that's like getting kids active for life and getting kids healthy and getting them physically active uh, um, outside of like, high performance sport whatever that means um i think that's that 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 that's yeah the part where a lot of more coaches should be but it's probably um, also not very lucrative like it's not really where you make money like i experienced that myself like it's yeah. not something where people want to pay for yeah exactly <laughs> people pay pay you as a coach yeah. um what what are we, um what what does your what does your training session look like with the kids, and also, what um, what do you consider youth, and what mm -hmm. age groups do you consider youth, and what is your, what is your a typical day? What does your training session look like? Um, <coughs> Excuse me. So, I always like I say kids for everything. I think <laughs> like for yeah, every like yeah. from. Yeah. So now when I'm talking about kids, usually I say like kids are from like eight to 12 and then from 13 till like 17, I, I say like as youth athletes um, yeah. and then from 18, it's like juniors, uh, 18, right. 19, 20, that's juniors for me. Like usually that's the, also the language that I use, even though I sometimes call like a 20 year old kid as well. <laughs> um, that yeah. happens. So, You're uh, not no, that much older than them, so be careful. Yeah, I look a bit. I, I look a bit younger than I am. Probably. How, old, how old are you? Yeah, I turned honest. thirty this year. How much? How I much? turned. 30, I turned thirty this year. Oh jeez, you're just a young yeah. pup, jeez, or puppet, yeah. whatever you call it. <laughs> um, but what? What's your? What would a, um, a daily training look like for maybe yeah. each group, maybe or just you know as a whole? Yeah, so 
Um, at the moment, I'm not active. Like at the moment, I don't I don't have a group um, because I'm in some kind of transition phase <laughs> to something else. But it, it like how it used to be was um, I had uh, I always had like uh, in primary school I had like uh, I we split the groups uh, into. Uh, like, or we split one class, like usually in a class, you have like 25 uh, kids and then you split them in two groups. Um, and we had, um, a, we actually had like a big PE project um, where they were uh, at the same time, they had different, uh, they had different, um, yeah, different interventions that we did. So I did the fitness strength training intervention and the other group, uh, or we split the group and the other group was uh, back in school and they had cooking lessons. And then while this one group of kids was doing their fitness stuff, the other group was cooking and learning how to cook. And then they cooked for those kids that were training. And then the, sure. we, the kids drove back to school from the gym and then they had lunch together from what the other kids were cooking. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a the project and then after uh, we did that for eight weeks and after eight weeks we switched to groups and then like those that had the, fit, the fitness or more strength training stuff they went to the cooking classes and then I had those the cooking kids uh, in, in, in strength training and that's how we always switched um, in there was additional to their normal PE classes so it's not mm -hmm. that um, this was implemented in the school but it was uh, part of it um, so I usually like I always took like I always planned 90 minutes, um, but we never really did 90, like it was never like moving for 90 minutes, but um, we always had like because it was in a school, it has to be some there has to be some educational stuff around it. So this is um, why they also got homework and, and stuff like that. So um, I always started with like just some general, um, I just let them have like free play for 10 minutes, um, whatever they want to do. Um, they had a few rules in the gym, so not using any machines or any heavy dumbbells or whatever, but they were able to like run around and, and maybe climb on the pull up bar or um, yeah, we had a big rig in the middle, um, they were able to like, or maybe we had a rope as well where they were swimming, swinging, stuff like that. So 10 minutes just for themselves. Um, then we usually did like a, like a, I always like, but I'm not a teacher, I'm a coach. Like we always had like a ritual where they were singing the song together in the beginning. I like, I can't do stuff like that, but I had always a, a, um, a teacher from school who did that with them. I, um, I wanna say, what, I, what I wanna see is the TikTok dance. Yeah, they did. Yeah, so yeah, we did stuff like that. I, but that's something I'm not gonna publish ever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many TikTok dances I've done already, um, but I, I quite- I just, want, I just wanna see a demonstration of one. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead i'm sorry but it's, but it's some yeah i talked I, I talked about that in um in the other podcast yeah but that's the easiest buy-in of like the i don't like probably you, you you make yourself pretty ridiculous but when you do a tiktok dance with a bunch of kids they like you after that and like they they think you're the coolest so it's like that was the easiest. It was the easiest buy-in for me, um, and uh, yeah. And then we we usually started with um, we then did some. We played a game where everyone was involved. I always try to to keep activity time um, as high as possible. So no, I'm not playing games where someone is like losing in the beginning and then has to sit out or stuff like that. That's these kind of games are not really useful for, for warming up. So always something where everyone has to move much. Um, and then we did in the beginning we did. Yeah. I had like a teaching progression for, for the Olympic lifts. Um, and we did in the beginning, we did uh, of the eight weeks, we usually did like 10 to 15 minutes of technique work with the PVC pipe or, um, or the, the, yeah, or the plates, um, or the, these plastic plates that we had. Um, and then we progressed that over time. 
um, in the beginning, they, their attention span was uh, was not really, really high. So like it was 10 to 15 minutes that they could maybe focus on that. And then we had to switch up. Um, but in the end, they were able to do actually to focus for like almost 30 minutes um, and, and practice that. So with competency, so when they are more skilled in something, they also are able to focus more on that. Um, and then we, I did a lot of circuits, uh, kids love circuits. I don't know why, but like kids love circuits with having a, with having a watch and seeing how much time they have to do a certain task. Uh, that's always better than letting them count something. Um, and, uh, yeah. And then we played a lot of, played loud music and then and, and play the game and in the end uh, so that's how how a session usually was um, I always gave them homework to learn to to practice on something um, that was in school and out of school so basically uh, I had a few kids that um, came to sessions out of school um, there it was basically the same structure but there we could really there there I could implement those those color system with uh, okay we are, because we have way more time we're progressing over a longer period of time and we then move up with um, with the colored plates and 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 making all those deals and setting goals and stuff like that yeah so that was in those sessions out of school I think I taught her or I had I coached around twelve. 12 till 15 hours a week yeah as I said before like it's not my main job <laughs> I think a lot of people think that um that coaching kids is actually my main job but it isn't um yeah I worked for uh as I said I worked full-time for general weightlifting um that was then the high performance part uh I did I had camps with different kids there um but on a different level um, and, uh, yeah, now I'm, now I'm working here in Luxembourg, um, in the sports or in an, in an, yeah, in an executive, uh, department of the sports ministry. Are you still coaching? Well, I mean, you're coaching kids, right? Yeah. And I'm like, uh, yeah, at the moment I'm mainly coaching camps. I'm not coach like I don't have someone uh, weekly at the moment. I just coach camps, so I coach like in a soccer uh, in a soccer club, um, and um, I coach. Yeah, I mainly coach camps at the moment. So, so what do you do? What's your role in the camp? Um, do you, do you coach soccer, or do you coach the fitness or something? Yeah, like a, a bit of the high, like a bit of like a hybrid. I would say it's like um, I'm very good in organizing camps. Um, like so, every like I do what I do is like everything around the technical and tactical part of soccer, for example um or basketball or whatever so um i do like the athletic development stuff um we teach them for example uh, uh lifting techniques uh, or we try to improve the improve that um then what we, where we what i also do is like um just be like like this whole i would say like this whole psychological part or mental part that's also like part of youth sports like where you just be there as a coach and and try to for example um do team building uh team team building stuff and yeah i i mainly do that everything that's not really tactical or technical in soccer um, yeah but the no, pandemic um, ruined a lot i have to say that <laughs> like the pandemic is makes stuff very difficult um I got so I want to go back to this talent identification thing, mm -hmm. and um, what so initially, and what were you looking for? And I, I don't want to make this about weightlifting, but s since that's what you did, we'll talk about it. But what what kinds of things did you look for initially, and at what age did you start the talent identification? Yeah, so. Um, I think I talked about that in the in the in in the other uh, in the resilient uh, performance podcast as well. So, um, 
I changed my opinion about talent identification. During that, the job. that was going to be my next question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I completely changed my opinion about that because um, the expectations uh, of, a, of, of the Federation um, were something that I couldn't meet with what mm. I know and, and with, with what, uh, with also what I think is right to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it's very helpful to to identify talents in in the youth uh, in, in 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 especially not during or before puberty. So, um, but it's something that I did at German weightlifting. Like we, we like we had talent, or we did had these talent identification camps where we collecting uh, where we are collecting data, for example. Um, and um, where we were trying to see is this is this kid able to or has, does this kid have like a good vertical jump or a good horizontal like standing good standing broad jump um, is he able to to um, execute uh, um, coaching cues very quickly stuff like that so it was a map like I, I I did that and 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 but at the end of the day, I don't think, I don't think um, it really identified any talents. <laughs> like well, it was, I, I, I tend like, to agree with you. Day, it was like it was very yeah. like, the job I did. I, at at the end of the day, um, I feel like oh, what my experience was in those two years is like sometimes I just have a feeling of someone that that has he he or she had something like something special it's Mm. very also not it's very difficult to quantify that I think I've seen that in several not just in weightlifting but also in other sports I had rugby players where like where I could see like okay the way he uh, is moving and the way he approaches uh, the game or the way he's playing he definitely has some talent for that um, and it's very sometimes it's very subjective. Uh, it's very hard to quantify. In in my opinion, it's very hard to quantify um, what a lot of those players or athletes really have. What makes them special? Um, it's it, it's that I think that's also then at the end why I've decided to leave um, is like because um, the job that I did um, was not really was not really the right thing to do um, for youth develop or for developing young athletes. It was not right thing um, in, in, I couldn't really, ex- I couldn't really, I would say I couldn't meet the expectations because of, um, I couldn't meet the expectations because of, I don't want to be that person that says, okay, this is a talented athlete for weightlifting at the age of 13. Right. I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Like, right age of 13 even 14 or 15 even 16 i would say you can't identify a, a talent like you can't can't identify if this athlete is is gonna make it to the top spot it's also i, I always say that um especially when i'm talking to people from the u.s um what we are looking for here in NGBs in Germany is Olympic athletes. We are not looking for like someone who gets a college scholarship. We're not looking for someone who's like gonna be uh, competitive on national level. So when I talk about talent identification for German weightlifting, then the goal was for me, you have to find next Olympic medalist or you have to find the next Olympic participant. It's not someone that's going to just be ex, um, like, it's just going to, it's not going to be someone that's just uh, successful in college or something. So the, 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 and that's a way more difficult, um, that's a way more difficult, uh, um, ex, yeah, way more difficult uh, expectation from, because how am I going to know at the age of 14, 15, if that boy or that girl is going to be successful in weightlifting? I don't know. <laughs> and and it's also not fair towards those kids to, uh, it's not fair towards those um, that are maybe that we would consider talented because uh, you you also don't really know if, 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 if they are. And then you maybe 
let them go through all of that, what it takes to become uh, an elite athlete. And then at the end, you, it does, it's not enough because you actually can't really say if that's enough. It's also not really fair towards those that um, you are not picking and where you say, okay, this is, I'm sorry, but that's not enough for becoming, um, right. becoming a weightlifter. So, so do you think, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think it's uh, talent identification is something very, very difficult. Uh, and, and I'm very like, uh, I'm also uh, like, I would also say it's a job where I'm too young. I'm too, I'm too unexperienced for um, because I think you can maybe identify talents if you've worked in those fields for 30, 40 of 20 30 40 years and when you've you've seen athletes developing and when you know what you're looking for and when when you when, when you have developed someone so I was in this job and I was way too young for it and I don't think someone my age and with my experience should do such a job I don't mm -hmm. even think that job should exist but um yeah that's something <laughs> Something about talent identification is I think you just that's something where you have to rely on on people that really, really, really have experience in the sport right. over a variety of maybe also different sports. Um, talent so identification is difficult. Yeah. So you can't see it just by testing numbers, right? No. So I, I would also think that the age of maturation would fall into fall into play there yeah you know, some of them are a year or two behind everybody else and I mean we, we see it in football or you know basketball and stuff where kids are really great 14 year old and then he becomes 18 19 years old you don't hear about him anymore yeah you know, so we, we see that all the time even you know especially at the college level and, and even at the high school level but um, um no that's 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 really interesting to me I, I I wanted to I wanted to find out about that but uh um, yeah, I think I think and that's something um, that's probably what all sports scientists and, and researchers in that field of talent identification, what they hate. But I think talent identification is very often like it's a feeling in your gut, like you you just yeah. see someone and you feel like, OK, that that athlete has something special and yeah. Very often you can't really describe it. Uh, like that, that's what at least I felt like. I've seen a lot of kids and I've also seen very special kids, I would say, where I would say, okay, they are talented, maybe not for weightlifting, but they are athletic uh, or they are talented for sports um, in a way where I also really can't, can't describe it. I've, I've had one girl actually, um, she's like, uh, she's like she, she must be like 15 or 16 now. Um, I met her the first time when she was 10 and um, this was a very like a very very shy girl like very like you couldn't when you saw her you didn't really think that um, she like she was very she didn't really that was one of those girls that you that you see through like she doesn't really she doesn't really no one really notices. it's not very not very extrovert or anything like very shy and when we played, when we started playing games, you could see that in the, that, like that little girl switched and was a, and that girl had a competitiveness that I've yeah. never seen before in anyone else. Like this girl, when we played dodgeball, you had to stop her murdering people. Yeah. Like that was like the way she played games was so extraordinary. And I thought, okay, this is a kid that I would consider talented for sports I don't even know which sport she, if you can teach her the, the the technical and tactical aspects of of anything she will probably be successful in that because the way she the way she is like the way she moves and then uh, in combination with that competitiveness that's really something special um and uh, I always like I think that's something like that I've learned is it's very often very hard to describe what you see in the, in some athletes. And then they ha also have to find the right sport for them, especially when you're doing talent identification with kids. It's, um, it's it, like. 
is that why you think the multi-sport approach is so one of the reasons is so important is so that, so they find something yeah i think it's very like i think multi-sports is important it's, it's important to expose kids to sports. I don't think it's important to, to say, okay, we have a kid that's playing now a season of baseball and then a season of, does a season of wrestling and then says, does a season of track and field. I don't think that's important. I think it, what, what really is important is to expose kids to different sports so that they find something that they really are probably passionate about. Because I don't, I think a lot of kids don't find their sport because they are putting into a specific sport by their parents. Um, that's usually how kids get exposed to sports. It's through their parents. Um, and then they, they actually don't really get access to anything else. And then they are stuck in that sport. And then when they're not talented for that specific sport, then that's, then it's basically over for them. And like that transfer maybe to another sport is uh, that rarely happens. Like it really, it really, really happens. I think a lot of kids might be very talented for specific sports, but they just never get exposed to that. Like I had, I had a kid once, um, he was in the, in those, in this weightlifting class. And, um, he also played, I think it's, it's his, because it's his father was a passionate table tennis player. He had to play table tennis and he wasn't bad. Like he was actually pretty good at table tennis, but like not really good, good, like good. Right. And uh, we went on a camp and then we had like a morning. We, we, I actually did that to like have a, like to mix it up. And we had, did, did like a morning run. And that kid just enjoyed running for long. Like the, he was like circling around. And I was like, how, why did you never go? Like, did you ever go to track? Like, because you actually like, he said, yeah, I like running, but like, no, I've never really thought about that. And I was like, yeah, maybe you should go to track. <laughs> you should maybe like middle or long distance. Maybe that's, if you really, really enjoy that, why are you not doing that? And um yeah, that and 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 I always wonder like I don't have contact to that kid anymore, but I was like, okay, that there was the moment where okay, like I have to expose them maybe to that, or we expose them to that. He really enjoys running like a lot longer distances. Maybe you should try that because he would probably be very good at that. Sure. So yeah, um, that and um this is why I'm so I think this is why multi-sport that's how that that's what multi-sports should be about it should be about kids finding what they really like what they enjoy and maybe also maybe also find a sport where they can be successful or where they have talent like that I think I talk I, I don't know who I talked about that the other day, but I think there are a lot like the state of weightlifting in the US could be much better. I think there are a lot of talented athletes in the US that could become weightlifters, but they never getting exposed to that sport. Right. And I, I you know, I, I can't help but think as many people as we have in this country, how many kids we've lost because the only sports they're exposed to is soccer, football, basketball, and baseball. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, we've, we're supposedly have the best of everything. Then, you know, why? Why? It, it always fascinates me. I used to have this argument with the people at USA Weightlifting. How come we got 300 million people in this country and we can't find eight or ten to to compete for a world championship? You tell me. You know. Yeah. And. Uh, um it, it, it just always fascinated me um i got one last question i think Corey, do you have another question i know i know Corey had this big list and of I questions one, some, maybe something to add to that i think okay. it's also what is really like i think i don't know if you say weightlifting is making approaches into that direction but it always like it always bothered me that there's not really there are not many people of color in weightlifting mm -hmm. even though that should be it. like I, I don't know but like there's so many football players that don't make it into the nfl or basketball, um, yeah. Like, or, or uh, yeah or uh, like especially the heavier guys um I, I don't think there's super heavy like oh no they have a super heavy weight in the u.s at the moment but um there there could be so many athletes 
football players that don't make it into the NFL that could easily transfer oh, to yeah. weightlifting. Um, but, and I, I always wonder why that doesn't happen more. Like, I it think, would been so easy to do. I think, I think part of the problem is that um, the strength coaches, when they're young, don't don't want to um their their teaching is really poor the teaching of the olympic lifts is really poor in this country for for the most part now, there's some good ones but but part of the problem is that you have these football coaches i I'm, i've actually had football coaches tell me you know i don't want them weightlifting because i don't want them taking away from football I tell them we're not, we're not taking away from football. We're doing all the thing, all the other things you want us to do, right? All we're doing in the off season when they're not doing anything is going to a weightlifting meet, and they're so afraid that they're going to get an athlete stolen from their from their team. Uh, that's that's another reason, you know. They they they're, you know, I'm not I'm you know, I've, and I've told them I said I want him playing football. You know, because that helps me in his weightlifting, you know, as far as being a general athlete, right? Yeah. And 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 then the and then you add on to that that the coaching of the lifts themselves is generally very poor. And so it's just it's it's kind of an afterthought. But yeah, you're right. I mean, there's there's tons of these guys like you know, around that I I, I had one, he was a freshman or eighth grader, had been working with me a couple of years, knew how to do the lifts. I said, Peters, I want to take you to a, a weightlifting competition. And he goes, okay, fine. And I said, but I want you to still play football, right? He goes, yeah. okay, well, six months later, he comes to me and he goes, uh, I just looked at Notre Dame's, uh, he says, I'm going to quit football because I just looked at Notre Dame's roster and there's nobody five foot three on their roster. I said, you're, you're exactly right. <laughs> And not that he was a great weightlifter. I mean, he did, he did well for his talent and he worked very hard at it. And, but, um, you know, he got his college paid for because of it, but, um, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of what, that's kind of, that's kind of what you run into. You know, they can't, they can't see very far. Well, you know, if you're six foot tall and you're 290 pounds, probably you're not going to play in college or the NFL, you know? And, yeah. So, so that's, that, that's, I think that's part of the reason. And so, you know, you have a combination of all those things. And plus in the US, US, we don't have a good development system for weightlifting. Okay, so in their, in their athletic development model, they say, you know, no national competitions under the age of 13 or 14. And yet we have a eight year old national champion that, that you made a comment about, right? We, I, I think we even have a category that's 11 and under. It's been a while since I've looked, but you know, I always yeah. said, why? You know, we're not, we're not gaining, we're not getting anything from that category because they all quit. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like they, they burn out. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, that, that's uh, like, yeah, I don't, I don't understand that. I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I tweeted that the other day. I don't understand why USA lift, uh, USA weightlifting is allowing that. Keep Especially going for, going for her. Yeah. At the end of the day, this girl has like, um, has like the double amount of followers as like the two yeah. Olympic medalists of USA weightlifting. Like that's maybe might be and might be a reason. Like she has like the exposure uh, or giving exposure to weightlifting that that Olympians um not are not doing. You know, I, th and, I think you I think you hit it on the head earlier where you, when you were talking about your technique work. We're interested more in the final result than improving the technique. Yeah, yeah, you but know? like. Proving that's something I've also learned now on uh, on strength and conditioning uh, at Twitter. It's technique work is something that I think I think the other like yeah I said that in a podcast before I said like whoever tells like oh I can teach someone to clean in ten minutes hasn't understood how learning works yeah. because that's not 
like of course I can show someone a movement yeah. and then he can imitate it afterwards but that's yeah. not learning and I think maybe that's something like where I like because I've worked so much in schools and and I had so much contact to teachers and I learned a lot from teachers and that's where where why I have that opinion but like there were literally college college strength coaches who say no but I can I can coach someone I can teach someone a clean 10 minutes you can or maybe 20 um and then uh, I was like yeah but this is not they haven't learned it afterwards they haven't really they haven't really understood how much they have to accelerate the barbell or how that even like what they have to do actually like learning is something different learning is when when you get consistency into the movements that's when you know that they've learned it actually and if you work with kids and uh, even with um even if you if you work with young athletes so 14, 15, 16 year olds you sometimes teach them something and the next day they can't even remember what you did <laughs> you sometimes like have a whole session yeah you do a whole session and the next day they can't even remember what, yeah. what it was about so that's not really like these these oh i teach you a clean in 10 minutes that's not really a flex <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's so, not learning <laughs> well i interrupted Corey. i know he's got another question for you sorry about that Corey. <laughs> i was just gonna yeah, say go all on. you rufus finish finish it up all you so, um, I don't know, do you have anything else you want to talk about, Elizabeth, Liz, um, Elizabeth? God no, not for now. Like, I think I just, uh, just, just in, 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 into like maybe that, uh, that, 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 that topic about the eight year old, uh, that's doing so much weightlifting. Um, I think it started very well with her. And uh, she 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 was a great example for strength training. Like why strength training is uh, is 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 good for kids and it's not really harmful. And then it took a took a direction. It took a turn into a direction that I personally don't support. Mm -hmm. um, I know that others have a completely different opinion on that, um, but it's very it makes life of other strength coaches very difficult because we are still fighting all those stereotypes we are still fighting all those old misconceptions uh, around yeah. growth plates and around like burning out we, it's it's not going to it's not going to having an effect on, on on growth plates we're still fighting all those old um misconceptions and it's not particularly helpful to have like eight or 10 or 12 year olds that do one rep maxes mm. um, it, it doesn't help anyone in that field um, and this is always my it's a bit of my concern I don't want to I, I don't also want to I don't want to point her out in particular because there are a lot of others that do the same um, but it's it it, it may it's another it, it's putting putting rocks into into other people's uh oh, yeah. into those that are also working in the in the in those in those field um and um strength training for kids is great and i think we have to we have to find that balance in the middle like with kids that do one rep maxes here and kids that should only do body weight exercises on the other side i think we have to find that that middle path and um, yeah, and maybe to to also summarize or, or maybe maybe repeat what I said before, I think we need way more strength coaches working with uh, young athletes that are not going into the high performance elite whatever direction, because it's it's also it's it's a field um, where like as I said the ex the 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 barrier. Um, the barrier of strength training is very low. So everyone can do it. Everyone can start and everyone is going to be successful in it. So um, this is where a, a lot of more strength coaches that are complaining about today's youth should actually do the work and yeah. get kids more physically active again. Yeah, no, and, I, yeah I, that's I think everything I want to say at the end. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, uh, let's promote you a little bit here. What, um, what, what do you have a website? I know, I know you've got a website and how yeah. can people find you on the, on the internet and different things? And 
and yeah. just go ahead and give that out. Corey, if you'll put if you'll put this on our when we link it, Corey, Corey does all the computer stuff. I'm too old to figure it out. So yeah, I do have a website. I, I've published like an online course uh, about strength training with kids. That's kind oh. of my way of uh, that's the, like I, I'm I'm I think that's the first time I'm going to say that. But this is my way of financing what I do. Um, it's like uh, if people buy education from me, <laughs> then sure. I can coach kids for free. Uh, so this is a bit how it works. Uh, or so that's how can, it works. can you expound on a little bit? Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, it has like it has uh, it is it's around three hours of uh, video content. I've done tutorials on how to teach uh, weightlifting techniques to kids. Um, then there's a theory part um, about all the debunking all the the misconceptions around growth plates, safety. What are the actual benefits? How do kids react or how do they adapt on 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 on, of, on strength training? Um, and then there's a the last section is about how to uh, about program design, how to design a good kids program. How can I do progressions um, for a squat, hinge, push, pull movements? Um, and the last part is about how to make it fun, where I'm like trying to have like some educational methods that I've used in the past, um, how to make strength training for kids actually fun. That's the last part. Yeah. That's it. So they, they, they can get that off your website, right? Yeah, it's on my website. Yeah. And then you're on Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, and almost everywhere. Like Facebook, uh, not really, but uh, Twitter and then and, and, and yeah, Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. Exactly. So Corey will put links up to all those things. Um, yeah. I got well, it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, re I really enjoyed this. This was fascinating. And, okay. uh, um, <laughs> It, it really was. I mean, I learned a lot, and uh, um, no, that's good. <laughs> you know, so I mean, that, you know, that's so we started doing this just so we could learn. You know, and just talk to talk to guys that you know we don't have a chance to sit down and talk to. And, and uh, I was telling Corey about you, and he goes, he goes, get her on. I said, okay, so so, yeah. uh, but that, that that was very good. Uh, sometime in the future, I'd like to do it again. Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah, uh, like for me, it's always interesting because I'm very, I feel very isolated in Germany. I actually like, it, it, I've, I've, I've recently um, analyzed my uh, Twitter followers <laughs> because oh, yeah. I want to see where people are from, like what, 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 where are they from? They follow me, and it's like I think it's like two percent Germans and like really? sixty percent you, like people from the US. Um, really? around like 10 to 15% from the UK. And it's like, it's very interesting for me that what I do is not very popular in Germany, but it is kind of anywhere else in the world. So um, especially in the US and that's very interesting for me. Um, like to see that, um, uh, yeah, that, that other people from other countries are, are way more interested in my work than Germans actually are. <laughs> Well, it's not that it's, it me, it's cool not it's not that popular what you do what what here either. So, uh, yeah. you know, er, everybody wants to get to oh, let's lift the heavy weights because we gotta get stronger for tomorrow. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and my philosophy is, let's learn how to do it and get stronger for six, seven, eight years from now. You know, yeah. it really means something. You know, yeah. and, and, uh, or at least in our case, you know, when the college scholarship guy comes around, you're about sixteen, and uh, um, so, well, that's that's great. Thank you very much. Thank I, you. I really, Thanks for coming really, on. Really appreciate it. And, yeah. uh, that, that was a lot of fun. So.